everybody. Good to be with you today. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention and for being with me. Now, on today's presentation, we are going to treat this with kid gloves. We are going to treat this with dignity, honor, and respect. And this is the Cash Landrum incident, December 29th, 1980. Uh, two lives have already been lost on this incident. The surviving witness, Colby Landrum, is the last one left. And it's really our job to preserve an important part of our national history, and we need to continue with this legacy. I am not going to let this case die. Now, there's already been two people dead over this, so we have to keep this case alive, and this is really the final curtain call. So we're going to go through this case. We're going to take it slowly, and just to set things up, again, December 29th, 1980, this is near Huffman, Texas. So we've got Betty Cash, we've got Vicki Landrum, we've got Colby Landrum. It's about 8.45 p.m. And this is uh, near Huffman, Texas. They're traveling southbound on uh, 1485. And they were looking for two bingo parlors. Uh, they were actually going to try uh, two bingo areas, and both of them failed. So they actually went to get something to eat. And right around 8.45 p.m. is when this all went down. Colby Landrum was in the back seat of the car, and he's the first one who noticed a white light approaching their vicinity. As it got closer and closer, it lit up the entire area. And in the words of Vicki Landrum, they actually thought it was the second coming of Christ. That's how severe this, the entire area was lit up, and this is wintertime. So at this point, Betty slams on the brakes. Vicki Landrum goes forward, and her hands are imprinted into the dashboard. They're actually melted into the dashboard. That's an interesting point. So next thing that happened is Betty gets out of the car. She opens up the door. She walks toward the forward hood of the, of the vehicle, and she's 150 feet away from this double ice cream cone diamond-shaped craft about 90 feet tall, it had a flat section where the, the lip of the double ice cream combs came to, together and there were what looked like lighted porthole windows. The upper section of the craft was rounded and we believe the bottom section was chopped off. Now this craft was emanating this blue colored flame. So every time a, a blue flame came out of the bottom of the craft, this craft would bob up slowly and then it would slowly bob back down. And there was a beeping noise associated with this, a loud roaring noise whenever the flame came out of this thing. And then as Betty was going back into the car, she held out her hand, grabbed the car door handle, and she burned her hand on the car door handle. She actually had to use the uh, flaps on her leather jacket to protect her hand. And when she got back into the vehicle, again, this is December 29th, 1980. When she got back into the vehicle, it was burning hot. They had to put the air on. So that's essentially the setup here. And let's let's continue on, and we'll we'll go on to the next slide here. So these are the primary eyewitnesses. We've got Vicki Landrum, Betty Cash, Colby Landrum. And I want to proceed here with an illustration by Joel Christopher Payne. And now you can see this whole scene coming into view. You've got Betty uh, kind of looking at the craft here and the intense beeping sound heard by all three eyewitnesses was a radiation warning indicator. So this is lending more credibility to a, a man-made component to this entire case here. Uh, and you can see, we're gonna talk about the helicopters in a little bit here, but at the very least we have 23 double rotor Chinook CH-47s that were chasing after this craft. They had spotlight shining on the scene, but that's our setup here. And let's go on to the next slide here. Now, we talked about the double ice cream cone configuration. The actual terminology for this is a rhombus. A rhombus is a quad quadrilateral whose four sides all have the same length. So that is the actual terminology of what this craft actually was here, and we'll move on. What you're looking at now is what I believe, I put this together based on John Schusler's uh, drawing within his book, the most accurate detailed 
map layout drawing of what actually occurred here. Now, if you look at the bottom left, we've got the legend here. So balloon number one is the initial encounter. So you can see up on the top section here, location of Betty's car. That's where she put on the brakes. And then I've got the dimension 150 feet. So X marks the spot. That's where this craft came down. So it's the intersection of FM 1485 and Inland Road. And then the craft was going from the upper right to the lower left. That's the path that this thing was following. So three and four and two location where the trio stopped to watch the UFO departure. And then I've kind of done a detailed drawing here. This is an AutoCAD drawing uh, just showing you what this may have looked like. So this I believe to be the most accurate map of what this encounter technically looked like here. So if we go to M Google Maps and we go to intersection FM 1485 and Inland Road, west of Dayton, Texas, this is shortly before 8.45 p.m., this is what you're going to see. Now, there is some evidence from John Schlusser that indicates that a major portion of this road was completely changed from what it was then to where it is now. But according to the map, this is where it all went down. Now, I want to highlight one important point that's not talked about. Very soon after this event, and I want to thank everyone for being on the stream here. Very soon after this event, according to John Schusler, the Army Corps of Engineers came in and they dug up the road. And then two weeks later, they did it again. Can you believe this? They actually dug up the road again. So because it left this big burn mark on this pavement here. So they dug it up once and then they repaved it twice a second time. It's unprecedented, absolutely incredible. Let's move on here. Now we wanna talk about the helicopters. What type of military helicopters were involved? Well, Vicki Landrum personally counted 23 CH-47 Chinooks. Each one has a crew of three. They also counted at least two UH-1 Bell helicopters, crew of two and then one Sikorsky Sky Crane with a minimum crew of three. So if you add this all together here, we've got 76 additional potential witnesses that could be interviewed. They must know something about this. Uh, my question is, where are they? Will they ever come forward? Were they irradiated by the radiation? Were they, uh, did they all have security clearances? Were they shielded from their cells personally? And were the helicopters shielded for radiation? These <clears throat> pilots, crew members, they need to be tracked down. This is the final curtain call. Okay, I want to give credit to John Schuster for doing the best investigation on this case. Uh, he had done a very good job on it. No one has done better than John Schuster investigating this case. I want to give credit for his book right here, The Cash Landrum Incident. Three Texans are in, injured in an encounter with a UFO and the military here. So this is kind of my first past illustration. You can see 90 feet tall, about the size of a water tower. This is in the daylight here, just to give everyone an idea what this thing may have looked like. And then this is an, another pass here. You've got this rhombus configuration. Now, according to John Schusler, he said that there was a flat section wrapped around the outer circumference of the craft itself where the seams of this double ice cream cone rhombus came together and there was, was what looked like lighted porthole windows wrapped around that flat section here. And let's continue on. So here's the AutoCAD drawing. You see the flames coming out of the bottom of it. So whenever the flames came out of the bottom with this roaring noise and this beeping noise, this craft would slowly bob up and then it would slowly bob down again and it would repeat the cycle here. Let's continue on. So, of course, I started digging, right? I thought, okay, if this is a man-made craft, can we find any evidence to indicate any type of paperwork, something that we can dig down on this? Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Program hearing before the Subcommittee on Research and Development of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, U.S. Congress of the United States, 86th Congress First Session. This is July 23rd, 1959. So in their own documents here, if you look further here, take a look at the procurement funding here. ANP Manned Aircraft Program Summary, Fiscal Year 1946 to Year 1960. So look at the players involved here. United States Air Force, the Navy, the Atomic Energy Commission. So all this time, 
people within this field, you know, we've always thought that the Air Force is covering up this. Well, in point of fact, if you dig into this, it's not really the Air Force, but it's the Atomic Energy Commission in, in bed with the United States Navy. They're the ones driving the cover up. So if you look at the upper chart here, you've got 46 down to 60. By 1960, they all already had procurement funding of $811 million. So they spent almost a billion dollars on this aircraft nuclear propulsion program that's more than enough time for them to develop an atomic powered spacecraft, atomic powered engines, something that would have been a good prototype or a something in the field by 1980 when the Cash Landrum incident actually took place. They have more than enough time, research, and funding to do this here. So within this document, they give you these drawings, technical drawings. So look on the upper left, we've got nose cone, compressor atomic powered uh, jet engines. We've got atomic powered combustion rocket engines, atomic uh, turbo jet engine with two stage compressor. Uh, the lower right schematic sketch of an atomic liquid fueled rocket with subcritical reactor. That's the one we wanna drive down on here. So again, schematic sketch of an atomic liquid fuel rocket with subcritical reactor. So it appears that the Cash Landrum incident uh, there was an, an internal hull breach in the reactor and the craft began spewing out radioactive material, thereby severely harming all three witnesses. That appears to be what actually was going on here. All right, let's continue. Now, who would be the contractors? What aerospace contractors would have been involved in creating a propulsion system associated with this vehicle? Well, Pratt & Whitney for one, and the Aerojet Division of Rocketdyne. These would be two possible aerospace contractors that may have been involved in this whole event here. So what happens if we peel back the skin of the Cash Landrum craft? What, do, what are we going to end up with if we do this here? So here's a cutaway. Now I put this together under the direction of James Petty, who's a rocket engineer, and I'm going to kind of go over some of these points here. If you look in the center part of this craft, You've got magnetic coils five times. Over on the right, you've got heating antenna. You've got helicoid antenna. You've got quartz beryllium. You've got crystal tube, plasma and ejector plates, and electromagnetic coils for thrust vectoring. So if there was a hole breach in the reactor here, these ejector plates and magnetic coils would be spewing out this radioactive material, and that's what affected the three primary eyewitnesses here. Okay, so let's go into the, some of the newspaper clippings here. Florida Today, December 4th, 1983. Trace effects, the Cash Landrum incident. So if we do a little bit of a blow up here, and we're going to uh, blow this up here. What did three Texans encounter? Sighting of UFO brought illness, but few answers. Clarion Ledger, December 25th, 1983. So I want to document my sources here. So you've got Betty Cash, Colby Landrum, Vicki Landrum, and researcher... John Schusler. So let's do a blow up here again. Mystery. They don't say UFO, but the agony lingers. The Times, December 25th, 1983. Okay, now here is our portion of the road. Lonely road through East Texas forest near Dayton where Trio's trauma began. Again, the Times, December 25th, 1983. So let's talk about the physical effects that were suffered by the primary eyewitnesses. And we're going to break this down by person here. Radiation poisoning. Okay, so Colby, red skin, swollen eyes, stomach pains, diarrhea, anorexia, weight loss, increased tooth cavities. Vicky had swollen eyes, diminished vision, stomach pain, diarrhea, anorexia, ulceration, keratin effects, hair loss. Betty took the brunt of the effects because she was outside for at least four minutes at the very portion of the uh, hood of the vehicle. She took the brunt of this exposure here. So she had swollen eyes, vision impaired, stomach pains, vomiting, diarrhea, anorexia, loss of energy, scarring, and massive hair loss. So all three had severe effects of radiation poisoning here. Now, one thing we want to talk about here that's not mentioned very much is why did the United States Air Force try to buy Betty's car? I thought that was interesting. 
if there's nothing to this case, why would they be interested in buying this car? I thought that was an interesting point here. And let's go on to this case here. U.S. sued for $20 million for UFO damage. So they actually tried to bring this to court. And Peter Gersten, who is the lawyer who was also invo involved in the uh, Hudson Valley Boomerang uh, case as well, he tried to go to court and sue on behalf of the plaintiffs for $20 million for UFO damage. And they threw this out of court. I can't believe it. This is the Sun, January 22nd, 1984. So they never actually got to hear their case in court. It was completely thrown out. And I want to talk a little bit about that. So why would this be thrown out? Because if the case actually went to trial, it would be a tacit admission that the United States government was indeed working on classified aerospace vehicles, which incorporated a nuclear propulsion system, and they didn't want to be held liable. That's perhaps the reason why this thing was thrown out of court here. Let's continue. Okay, Cash Landrum top 10 list. These are takeaways from this case here. The craft exhibited a loud roaring noise. Generally authentic uh, so-called so ET UFOs are virtually silent. This may have been due to a hybrid Pratt & Whitney aerojet propulsion system or an advanced design which utilized a helium which is heated and converted into a plasma ionized gas. Number two, according to the three eyewitnesses, the craft was seen to emit a blue colored flame which was coming out of the bottom of the object. This may have been due to increased oxygen content within the combustion chamber. Well, interesting because Lonnie Zamora also reported that blue colored flame as well. Number three, Betty Cash described what she called a beeping noise, which was present during the encounter. This may have been the result of a proximity indicator, which is standard hardware within the aerospace industry. This particular device warns pilots or operators that they are approaching the surface of the ground and take corrective action by pulling up to avoid a potential impact. Now, a more likely authentic response to this is that this could have been a radiation warning indicator. That could be the actual result of the beeping noise. Let's continue. Both Betty Cash and Vicki Landrum clearly remember counting 23 double rotor CH-47 Chinook helicopters, which appeared to be escorting the craft. The helicopters had searchlights on and were actively pursuing the object. This may have been due to a test flight gone wrong where the craft suffered some type of malfunction and got away from the helicopters. In addition, at least two single rotor Bell UH-1 helicopter gunships were also identified. If we allow for a pilot and co-pilot of the 23 CH-47s plus two UH-1s, that would mean a minimum of 50 men still know what happened on the night of December 29th, 1980 near Huffman, Texas. The actual number is larger because we've got the Sikorsky Sky Crane too. According to Betty Cash, the United States Air Force tried to buy the automobile involved in the incident. If nothing happened, why would the Air Force be interested in purchasing her vehicle? Perhaps the U.S. Air Force didn't want any physical evidence remaining from the encounter. This particular evidence includes the melted dashboard with Vicky hands prints, which were permanently melted or burned onto embossed due to excessive heat. Additional physical evidence on the vehicle included warped or wrinkled paint near the forward hood and an inoperative clock and radio. Let's continue on here. The event happened within 230 miles of Fort Hood, which may have been a staging area for the helicopters. Fort Hood is believed to be a location of a large underground facility that I already talked about in a previous presentation here. Multiple reports from personnel who work at the facility describe seeing a giant sliding door with a camouflage exterior, which reveals a large underground complex. That's Gray Army Airfield within the jurisdiction of Fort Hood. According to researcher John Schusler, unmarked utility trucks dug up the surface of the road where the craft had made a large black or burned spot. The road surface was ground up and repaved to conceal any evidence that the encounter had occurred. Interestingly, within two weeks, the entire surface process was repeated again. I mean, that's just incredible. All right, let's continue. 
Betty Cash, Vicki Landrum, and Colby Landrum all suffered severe physical effects immediately after the incident. Within a half an hour of returning home, Betty's skin turned bright red and her eyes began tearing up. Large blisters appeared over her face and skin. She experienced severe headaches and diarrhea. Within days, she lost large clumps of hair and her lips had swollen to three times their normal size. Here. Yeah, I think I'm going to go about here. So the, the complete lack of official U.S. government response to the incident when Betty and Vicky pursued legal action against the United States Air Force, their case was thrown out of court by the district judge due to lack of evidence. And I just wanted to kind of wrap this up here. If you're anyone who has actual firsthand knowledge of this case, uh, contact me through the comment section below. And I do want to thank you for your attention. And uh, please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for your attention.